working half time as a coordinator of this kind of European uh, cooperation between the trade associations, and half of my time goes then on working as a senior policy analyst in uh, NeoGames, that is the half of the half of the Finnish games industry. Um, unfortunately, I have a bit of flu today, so hopefully my voice will be okay for the presentation, but if you don't hear me well, just say so. So, first, some words about EGDF. Uh, we represent about 1,600 game developer studios from 13 different European countries that employ over 20, 25,000 people. Uh, we focus on policy development. So basically my daily work is to go through the consultations from the European Commission on uncertain from the game developer's perspective. Everything from consumer regulation to VAT to corporate taxation to protection of minors, uh, data protection, etc. Uh, then we of course disseminate best practices, standards, uh, tools, etc. among our member associations. And um, we try to unite the game developers behind the joint goals. It's not always that easy because mobile developers, console developers, online game developers, etc. have a bit different perspectives and different interests. Uh, but that's what we are for. Platform for discussion, platform for building a joint European focus for the games industry. So, First, before going to our, my actual topic today, some words about what is happening now in the Brussels. Uh, last year, new data protection framework, general data protection regulation was approved. <coughs> so you will still have about one year to get ready for that. Uh, basically, it means that uh, the back end of your games has to be redesigned in a way that it's privacy by default. Everything must be anonymized as far as possible and you have to build clear processes for that. There are lots of uh, this kind of data security consultant, consultants running around uh, at the moment telling that you have to pay thousands of euros for the consulting services about this. Uh, but in general, have a look on the regulation, have a look on the guidelines that are going to be published also by the local data protection authority here in Ireland, I hope, and uh, make your own conclusions on how much you actually need consulting help on that side. It's uh, more on the principal level, the way you operate, and have the details. But definitely something you should have a look on during this year before it enters the force. And keep in mind that your local government here in Ireland might actually change your local laws a bit, and um, those might come into force or very earlier. So, for example, in Finland, they are rewriting, if I remember correctly, about 700, 700 different pieces of regulation because of this data protection re uh, regulation from the process. So it's going to be a big thing for this year. Um, at the moment, what is discussed, there is a new consumer protection framework coming for the uh, digital single market area. So at the moment the games that are uh, provided in exchange of money are covered by the consumer protection. In the future that it will be all it will also be covered it will also be covering games provided in exchange of data. And uh, that will bring new rights for the consumers if the regulation will go through. Uh, copyright framework is updated at the moment. The rights of the people who are employed in the games industry Industry will might change a bit. Uh, there will be new responsibilities for platforms, etc. Also, the digital preservation of old games should be easier. That's discussed. Changes in VAT regulation, uh, VAT framework for digital single market was introduced two years ago, and uh, now they are noticing that there are some problems. Like everyone is in principle. Uh, responsible for paying the VAT, although they would be under the national VAT threshold, and that's a bit of a problem in the market at the moment. Hopefully, they are able to fix that. 
um, then something we are quite a lot uh, involved at the moment. Uh, we are discussing the role of the platforms, and especially, especially their contract terms, because in general, well, game developers are responsible for everything, and platforms don't usually take any responsibility on anything. And we find that position quite unfair. And we are now discussing with the Commission if there would be a need for some kind of political action on that side, or hopefully the platforms themselves will fix the situation. But let's go then to the actual topic. So first I will be discussing about why Creative Europe planning is so important for game developers in different countries. <coughs> So, what is often forgotten is that content is the real driver of innovation. Uh, back in the 1990s, we all remember like, how games on those days were really pushing Intel to create better CPU uh, processors. Um, same happened in the last decade when the networking technology was pushed by online games requiring also the upload speeds in addition to download speeds. Now, virtual reality, first content on those platforms is games, uh, augmented reality, location-based services, etc. Everything starts from the games and they are pushing the boundaries, requirements for the technology and business models. So, the pioneers in the games industry are actually pushing the innovation in the technological side and business side forward. The challenge is that uh, venture capital funding in Europe is much less risk-taking than in the United States, for example. And for that reason, uh, Europe is relying a lot on the different kind of public funding instruments. And uh, that's also the reason why the European funding instruments, like Horizon 2020, and Creative Europe are able to bridge the gap for those countries who don't have at the moment their own cultural funding instruments, like Iran, for example. Uh, we in EGDF uh, see games as a combination of artistic content, cutting edge technology, and innovative business solutions. And if you think, see it from the state aid perspective, we have funding for cultural content creation and then funding for technological and business innovation on R&D side. So, basically here we have Creative Europe on top and then on the bottom we have Horizon 2020 on the European funding instrument side. And content innovation uh, on that side we usually have grants and loans, uh, Creative Europe will be publishing its own loan instrument, hopefully in some countries. Um, but we already have the grants for video games. Um, these grants are really helping game developers to push the boundaries of the industry, creating something totally new, taking the risks nobody with uh, venture capital funding would be ready to actually fund. So when it comes to new genres, uh, storytelling methods for virtual reality, etc. We need this kind of risk-taking funding instruments that are helping the game developers to actually explore the unmapped territory of the interactive content areas that otherwise would be too risky to enter. Uh, then you have also in some countries tax breaks and of course for example Quebec has excellent uh, funding instruments for big AAA games. Um, for that reason, it's good that uh, there are tax breaks in some countries like uh, France and the UK to actually enable this kind of AAA productions in Europe as well. On the technological side, uh, they also enable risk taking on that side. For example, when the new platform emerges, you need new tools to create your games. Like when the mobile platform emerged, you needed a new backend server technology for mobile games to operate constantly with a server connection. With virtual reality, there are new requirements for new 
content creation tools on that area. And for that, you need, again, some funding instrument that help you to create the tools you need to enter the new emerging platforms and uh, push the existing platforms forward. A uh, bit of a dark side of uh, this kind of r and focused instruments is that sometimes game developer studios are better at making tools than making games. This has happened in Finland, for example, where some of our member companies have actually moved from the games to actually making the tools. Which is of course nice, good business for them, but you always lose some nice developers on that side. And then you also have in some countries tax breaks, and they are helping, of course, again, the risk taking. Um, something that is sometimes forgotten is that uh, European R&D funding also is including funding for business innovation. In Finland, uh, TECES, our R&D funding uh, agency, was one of the first in Europe to actually explore these opportunities well. So when the uh, free-to-play business model emerged, Finnish Game Developer Studios were able to get some R&D funding from TECES to actually explore the possibilities and limitations of these new funding instruments on how to build tools that, like data analytics for free-to-play arts. So you also need to remember that business models themselves are a crucial part of the games industry and you have to make research on them as well. And then you have SMEs report, uh, trade missions for example. They play a crucial role on information sharing and trainings as well. So uh, on the European level, uh, say we have the cultural content and the R&D content and for the cultural side perhaps the most interesting instrument for you is the funding for video game development we discussed this morning and the Horizon 20, 20 side you have an SME instrument it's also something you can apply alone the only challenge of the SME instrument is that uh, it's quite close to lottery already. You can they receive hundreds of hundreds hundreds and hundreds of applications per each round. It's very good money. It will get a lump sum of what is fifty thousand uh, euros for realizing something really innovating, something really risk taking. So it's really interesting, something to have a look on. I will now tweet the link here where you have the full list from the EGDF website of all uh, European funding instruments available for game, that are might be interesting for game developers at the moment uh, on the cultural side and on the R&D side. So, yeah, this one. so you should be now able to find from the games funding IRE and have a look on the list. Uh, in in general, when we discuss about European funding, I would say that those instruments that you can apply alone, that are Creative Europe and Horizon 2020, are the ones to start with. And entering this kind of big Horizon 2020 consortiums on the research side uh, might be something for when you have a bit more established on routines, you have enough uh, administrative resources for reporting, etc. So when we have a look on the state aid instruments used in different countries, uh, there are of course not all ECF uh, members here, but the ones we had at the moment when we made this study, we can have a look, we can see that uh, there are quite a big differences between the countries. And these differences are on the state aid instruments are also shaping the industry. Of course the state aid available for games is not the only factor uh, defining the identity and the focus of the local industry, but it's one of the factors behind it. Um, when we think about strong indie countries, um, especially Nordic countries, where, like in Copenhagen, in Denmark, they have a marvelous indie developer scheme there. In Germany, in Hamburg, uh, Berlin, uh, 
all sorts of likes in Munich. Uh, they have lots of really interesting English studios. And what's really, it's, what is really uh, uniting those places is that in all those places you have cultural state aid. Helping you to work as an indie studio, create something totally new, take risks, uh, push the boundaries, uh, work more from this kind of art for art sake perspective, and pave it away for the more commercially oriented uh, developers when you, uh, you have first to actually get, well, find out what works, what doesn't work. Um, so then you have the traditionally strong AAA countries, and especially in France and uh, in the UK, the tax uh, breaks have helped them to build up this kind of strong AAA titles. And uh, also in Sweden, but there is basically has been almost no public state aid for game developers. They have been much more relying on the publishers than other countries. For example, Mo they shift from the mobile uh, console to mobile was much more slower than in many other countries because of this. So they are relying on this kind of big old publishers a bit more than other European countries. Um, the story behind the reason why Germany become so strong in online games, like Big Point, GameForge, is actually quite interesting because it all started with trade missions. So the German companies got sponsored by German government to actually do trade missions to South Korea. They had this kind of bilateral agreement. And at that point they started to license South Korean online games to the Western markets. Um, thing being that uh, Europe is falling behind in the network infrastructure a lot compared to South Korea. So the South Koreans were already at that time uh, far ahead of you, Europe in terms of what you could be done. At the moment they are building one, you know, they are targeting 10 gigabyte connections very hard. They already targeted one gigabyte connections some year ago. In Europe we are trying to build 100 megabyte connections. So we are kind of behind. So what happens in South Korea at the moment is quite interesting from the perspective what you can actually do with that kind of connections. So on those days they were doing online games and they actually uh, took the team called free to play business model to Europe with those trade missions. And then the Finnish developers went to Gamescom and this kind of events and copied the free to play business model to the mobile side. So this kind of trade missions really play a big role in uh, building this kind of uh, new connections between countries, really copying the best practices and knowing what is going on in different market areas at different time. Uh, Finland has been uh, traditionally very strong in mobile. There are many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is the strong focus on R&D funding. So at the moment when new smartphones uh, emerged, Finland was in a way, very good position. We had the Nokia already at that point, but we also had the funding instruments for building all the technology needed to operate in the mobile environment with iPhone. And tech has played a very big role in that. And when you are actually supporting companies when they are struggling, they can be also quite thankful to you. So, for example, Supercell and Rovi are still paying taxes to Finland. And with these taxes, they have paid back many times all the investment the Finnish government has ever invested in the games industry. So supporting games actually is an investment for the government that is, can be really, really profitable. But something you have to keep in mind is that, of course, this is the total turnover of the Finnish games industry that is somehow connected to the turnover of Supercell. Uh, but, um, Supercell got 3.6 million euros from Tegas for R&D projects in 2010 to 2012. And they actually used the technology and the business models they developed to create a game called Kanshan. And they kind of noticed that it didn't work and they killed it. So then they used those same tools and 
those same methods to create games like Heyday, Clash of Clans, and Pool Beans that were huge success stories. And that's something that uh, you really have to understand that when you are supporting games, it's not the outcome of the one single project that matters. It's the actual outcome of what the company will be able to do based on what they have learned from the failures. So that's the really, clearly something that in the public side, policymakers clearly have sometimes problems understanding that failure is actually good, you learn from it, you move forward, and in the long run you can then build on your failures to create something great. Uh, but of course, state aid is not the only thing. For example, in Finland, uh, skills, there were, was a strong base on mobile technology already beforehand. It has more to do with Nokia than the state aid instruments. There's lots of talent, uh, mainly because of there is an excellent non-formal education system in addition to formal education. We have good games education institution, but we have even better youth clubs where you have, right now in the city of Helsinki, the, the kids are publishing their first games in App Store when they are 16. Of course those games are not top of the class, they are not like the greatest games, but if you publish your first game when you are 16, imagine what you can do when you are 26. You have grown up with the industry, you have failed, you have learned all your lessons, and when you make your first company, uh, you will be able to do amazing things. There's a strong community in uh, Finland. So what is really separates Finnish games industry from other countries is that uh, people are sharing a lot of knowledge. Uh, well, you not have uh, domestic markets, so you have a global focus from the outset. So you are not competing with each other. There is enough room for everyone on global markets. So basically you can tell most of your trade secrets immediately to your friends in the bar. But even if you have two persons with the same idea for a game, in the end they will have two totally different games from the same idea. So you can actually share the information and it really helps the ecosystem to grow because the games industry is moving so quickly forward. Things are changing so quickly that without sharing your information, uh, well, nobody is going to make it the industry. You have to ask from the people what they are doing, you have to share what you know, and that's the way to go forward as an ecosystem. In infrastructure, uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, Rovio is now launching Hatch in Finland. We have unlimited mobile data plans as a norm, so you only pay like uh, uh, 20 euros, 30 euros per month, and you get unlimited mobile data with that. So you can you use as much mobile data in each month as you want. It's not still possible in all European countries. And that, of course, helps you to experiment with this kind of Netflix for mobile games. It would be something unmatchable in Germany, for example, where you have to pay 200 euros for unlimited mobile data per month. For very strange. Uh, of course, they have quite lucrative data plans, like you get. Uh, 20 gigabytes for a certain amount, but still, if you have these kind of limitations, you are not really directing consumers the right direction. And then stability of the society, of course, is a good thing for the business environment. And functional public support system, of course, is one thing in the equation. Um, but there are also things missing from Finland. Uh, one of our challenges is that we need more top talent to the country. And our immigration services are not as great as here in uh, Ireland, as I heard, where actually getting people from some other countries in mean, Ireland is, especially outside Europe, it's quite easy compared to many other European countries. Uh, then, uh, well, that's one example. And of course, like Helsinki being located to the north, uh, it's a bit dark there, so you need to brand yourself a bit more than Dublin, for example. It's a great place to move yourself. It's a great place to move them. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back to the Creative Europe funding for game development, and um, its pros and cons. 
starting with the good side. So, in 2014, with the first round of applications, there were 259 uh, applications. And there is actually one person in Brussels who has to check all eligibility of all those applications. And he was a bit overwhelmed with the amount of work. But in any case, the number of uh, applications has went down from that to the 138 in 2016, as the eligibility criteria has got more strict and strict. So, for the next round, it might be that there is less competition in 2016 even. So it's a good time to apply. Especially because the budget, as previously mentioned, is, uh, has been increased by 1.28 million euros for the next call. So, number of applications going down, budget going up, well, chances are getting better. Uh, some other good things. Uh, it used to be 70 person pre-financed uh, in the first call, then they got it down to 50% for some calls, and now it's back to the 70%. I don't know how much uh, the fact that I have been complaining about this for three years has to do with this, that they chased it back. Hopefully it has something to do with that. But at least uh, they did it, so complain. If you <laughs> see that there are some problems, just keep on complaining, at some point they will listen to you. Um, Yes, it's bureaucratic, it's quite burdensome to write the application, but the actual management of the money, it's relatively easy to manage and report compared to, for example, European social funds or indirect funding or Horizon 2020 funding. It's still cultural funding uh, targeted for uh, artists, who, artists who might not be the best in the project management. And it can be applied alone. It's not something that is always the case in, with all funding instruments. So, next call will be a good opportunity for you. Unfortunately, there are some cons as well. As I say, the number of applications has been going down, and there is a reason for that. Uh, I had to do this kind of unofficial checklist for uh, uh, game developers because they were complaining it's so difficult to understand if they are eligible or not. So on the EGDF website, I will soon send you the link on that, you can have the checklist where you can try to figure out if you can apply for funding or not. The problem has been that this eligibility criteria has changed in almost each call. So even if you would make a game that would be eligible in the 2014 call, it was not sure eligible in the 2015 call. Luckily, now in 2017, this criteria has stayed more or less the same, and we hope, of course, that it will not be changed. Uh, or at least, if it changes, it will be relaxed a bit. But of course, uh, it's very, very difficult find out if you are eligible, especially if you are being building a racing game with narrative elements. You basically have to contact the Creative Europe desk to ask if this game is eligible or not, and they have to send the Brussels to the person to check it out if it works out or not. So if you are on the grey area, check it from the Creative Europe desk, they are ready to help you with this. <coughs> Don't just send the application and hope the best because it's a waste of your time to write an application that's not eligible and it's the waste of also the reverse time of your text. So check it. In principle, uh, you, it's not as strict as it uh, might look like. So even if you would have a game that would be in uh, somehow in the sports game genre, for example. But as long as there is a narrative content and you're only using element, gameplay elements from the sports games or racing games, it should be fine. But it's always be true to find out that one. So, I will now tweet you the checklist. Have a look on it. Uh, it's basically the guidelines in a different format helping me to actually find out what how the change is in the different calls. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, if you have any comments on the checklist, send me feedback on that and I'm try to make it better. Uh, for this call, not many things changed. So, we got back to the 70% refinancing rate. The total time of the project was extended to the 36 months to 30, from 30 months. So it's a good sign from the fact that this final instrument is finally getting more stable and it's not changing in each score. Um, another challenge is that there are, the people, there are two persons reviewing the applications. And for that, it would be kind of nice if there would be games industry professionals doing that. In the first rounds, they were really struggling to get game industry professionals to register as experts for the funding instrument. So, more they have had industry professionals, better feedback the applicants have had. So, that's something I, if you are not applying for funding from this side, that's something that you should consider doing. Register as an expert. You get 450 euros per day. And in principle, it means that commission will you send you a number of applications they think you should be able to review in one day. So you kind of just build the amount of time you actually used for that review process. Especially on the first time, it takes some time. Uh, the good side of doing it is that you have a quite unique look on what is happening in different European countries, how they approach games, so you actually learn quite a lot by reviewing different applications. And if you are going to apply someday funding by yourself, then you have quite a clear idea of what kind of application you should be writing because you will be frustrated to see how the strange ways people can interpret the rules. So, yeah, and they are especially looking for female experts at the moment. So that's something that if you know some industry experience, females in your industry, please uh, tell them that would be quite an interesting opportunity for them to check out. Um, there are also this kind of rotation going on for each call, and that's also the reason why they need more experts for each call so they can have the rotation going, so it's not always the same persons doing the reviews. But still, to a certain extent, uh, it depends a bit. That if you are lucky enough to get an industry expert that really understands your call. Because if you are uh, making a virtual reality game application, and it will be reviewed by someone whose background is really in the old school console, AAA console games. It might be quite a difficult thing to understand. And for that reason, it might make sense for you also to secure that when you are writing the application, write it in a way that also a person who is not expert in your field in the industry would understand it. So don't write it to a matter of mobile game expert or virtual reality game expert or console game expert. Write it to someone who has a general understanding of the industry but doesn't know the details and possibilities in your specific field. Uh, other things that are chances, uh, we of course think that also non-narrative games or cultural products just think about the uh, cultural uh, influence of Angry Birds or Classic Clans. Yeah, well known brands all over the globe have influenced many movies or films. So there is cultural content also in uh, non narrative games. Unfortunately, this instrument is only for narrative games. We hope to change that at some point. Can I ask a yeah. question? Why is it only for narrative games? What do you think the reasoning is? Uh, it's a long story, but to cut it short, uh, you have the, the state aid is divided on the R&D side and the cultural side. And games industry has been entering to the cultural state aid for years now. If you would have, say, 10 years ago that games are cultural products, people would have thought, no way. In 10 years, we have really worked hard to convince people 
the friends with the tax credit scheme were the first one to come to the European Commission the cheap competition that's really harsh on tax state regulation. Uh, then there was uh, British who have been working on getting the cards for recognition for games. So it has been a quite short process. I still reflect it in these funding instruments as uh, people think that, well, only the narrative games are the cultural part and the rest is not so cultural. But uh, we hope that, that will change in the future when uh, but we can already see the enormous cultural impact of games and you get the full recognition, hopefully. Uh, only companies that are more than one year old can apply. That's a big challenge, especially because the most interesting companies to actually benefit from this funding are the second round startups. You really experience industry players making their new studio and launching their first game. Those would be the ones if you would want, really want to have some kind of uh, strong economic impact with the funding instruments. They would need the funding, but unfortunately, they are not mostly rich. And also, there are many talented teams who are like first round startups, and they cannot apply as well. So it's a problem. Uh, the reimbursement rate is only 50%. In Horizon 2024, RD funding is from 70% to 100%. So I don't see the reason why the cultural funding should be lower than the RD funding. They are still, it's risky, it's uh, difficult, it takes time, especially as the funding instrument is targeted for creating something new, or something innovative. In direct cost rate is uh, only 7%, in Horizon 2020 is 25%. That's something I can partly understand because Horizon 2020 is much more further sum when it comes to the reporting. But it could be a big higher, uh, bigger. And the deadline at noon. They are telling me that it's impossible to change it in the system. Well, in the Horizon 2020, that's using the same uh, application uh, platform. It's at uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So it should be possible. But uh, in uh, principle, it should be in the midnight. Because so many studios are thinking it's on the that day, under the midnight. And hopefully midnight Irish time. Not the Brussels line, so all in Europe would be then complicated the same. Um, how to get the 50%? That's a challenge, of course. And usually companies have their own funding to cover that. Luckily, European Union also has this kind of uh, funding for loans and investments. EU doesn't make direct uh, investments to the companies or doesn't provide direct loans to the SMEs, but they actually provide some kind of support for intermediaries. So there are lots of banks in uh, Ireland that receive support from the European Union for providing uh, loans to innovative businesses. There are some venture capital investors who get uh, loans from the, uh, who get uh, support from the investment portfolios from uh, European Investment Bank and European Investment Investment Fund in order to support them to take risks. So have a look on that list, and um, they should be at least the ones who the Commission is kind of tell. Well, the Commission is kind of telling these companies that as we are giving you money. Either as loan guarantees or investing in your portfolios, you should be also taking risks. So if you knock the doors of these people, they should be the ones who actually should take some risks in principle. Of course, uh, some of them have their own focus. I totally understand that if you're running an investment fund, you might not want to invest in something you have no idea of. It works. So if you have only expertise on health technology, you are going to be investing in health technology. But uh, some of them are general funds, so check the list, see what there is, and uh, see if it works. And if you don't get any money from them, send me an email, because then I complain to the commission that the system doesn't really work, because they have been telling how Investing in EU is the greatest thing ever, and this current commission is really 
they are taking hundreds of millions of euros for this kind of loan on investment instruments at the moment and pushing them to the member states in order to create growth. And if these instruments don't work, it would be nice to know about that. So I just tweeted that for you. Uh, check the list from there. So my last thing to say is that send feedback. Send feedback to Creative Europe Desk from everything that you find problematic into calls, what chances you have, especially if you're re you feel that a person who did the review of your application did not really have any idea what he or she was doing. That's definitely something the commission should know about. Uh, send feedback about things you find problematic in the application form. Send feedback about the strange rules in the like narrative content because those are the things that uh, are going to be changed only if people are aware of them. Um, more commission receives this kind of messages from Creative Europe Desk all around Europe. More pressure they have to actually build a better instrument and change things there. Um, and I can just yeah. uh, interject there that they really do want feedback. So if yeah. you think there's something on your and on the feedback you get back from mm. from your application that doesn't sit right, they really want to know because they don't want um, uh, people reviewing the, the scheme who, who isn't or fail it don't actually know. So they 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 stress that very important. So if you do feel like there's um, something wrong in the feedback that you got or your points were wrong, um, yeah, definitely let us know. So really want it. So. And also, you can send complaints to me. <laughs> I'm happy to complain to the commission. <coughs> now they are still listening to me and are approving the meeting, so perhaps I'm not complaining too much. So send me an email if you have anything, any questions. Which uh, for you? Um, yeah. Let's read it out. Uh, so uh, Fremont was asking if uh, there's any weight given to the size of the dev team. Um, like, would a larger team be given a stronger consideration than a small team of say two or three people? I would say it's more about uh, quality of the team. Like that's the uh, sort of criteria there. Like, what's the background? What's what they can do? If you have a big team with uh, almost no experience. Mm. It doesn't really qualify uh, more than a small team of super talents. So. Yeah, and then if all of your funding is going towards, all of your top funding is going towards staff salaries yeah. then, because you've got a bigger team, that won't, that won't work. Mm. So yeah, a smaller team. And of course depends from the country, like on game you are creating, like in Romania, you can have quite a big team for quite a big production with the same money. Mm -hmm. And I don't pay you how to have I have a higher salary level, so you have to bring more quality on the table. Yeah, well, I'll be putting up the, uh, the presentation on the website, and I'll send all your... Uh, are you happy to share your presentation? Yeah, of course. Then, yeah, great. So both of them will be up the website, I'll send you the link to that. And uh, thank you very much for your from Helsinki. We'll be uh, posting the video as well from Twitch up on the YouTube channel as well, so we'll do that as well.